Hola, bienvenidos a Observatorio Cotidiano. Soy Fernando Castañeda y el día de hoy vamos a tener una conversación con una, un personaje realmente importante, eh, el periodista James Poniewozik. Él es responsable en el New York Times de hacer la crítica de los medios, particularmente de la televisión, y ha escrito un libro que se llama Audience for, of One, o una audiencia para uno, eh, que en verdad es una historia muy interesante. Es una histo es, son dos historias que corren paralela. El ascenso de Donald Trump, la evolución del, del personaje Donald Trump, por un lado, y por el otro lado, la evolución de la televisión y las transformaciones de la televisión. James, thank you for to be here with us in TV UNAM. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, in your book, I, I was just saying, in your book, you have those two stories. Yes. The story of the television and the transformation of TV, and also the story of uh, Donald Trump, the yes. character, yes. how this character was built. Uh, can you talk, uh, uh, tell us about this, why these stories are in parallel? Um, sure. I mean, uh, uh, first I should say, you know, the, the reason I wrote the book was, I mean, obviously the election of Donald Trump was this shocking political event that a lot of journalists were trying to make sense out of. But after his election, I, I felt that I wasn't really seeing that much analysis of what, to me, with my particular specialty, uh, was the most striking uh, cultural aspect of this, which is that the United States elected a television game show host, the President of the United States. How did that happen? You know, so I, I felt as somebody who has studied the relation of TV and society, uh, I was somebody who could try to make sense of that. And the story that I ended up writing to explain sort of how we got here is, I almost think of it as a, a dual biography in a way, a uh, biography not necessarily of Donald Trump the person, but of Donald Trump the character, you know, the persona that from the very beginning of his career as a businessman, he played in the media, cultivating celebrity, trying to gain the attention of the media, realizing that in our society, um, image is more important than substance. Often image creates substance. Uh, and then number two, it's the story of the medium in which he largely did that, uh, television. Um, and how he adapted himself over the years to create and evolve this character to the changing media times. So the story that my book finds in, in television, the, the sort of uh, arc of television from the early 1980s through the present, is the story of television changing from a very mass medium that aggregated large audiences to see the same things at the same time and, and thus in some way have kind of a common experience to a very fragmented, atomized constellation of media outlets in which people increasingly were not seeing and hearing the same messages or entertainments or philosophies of life as other people they lived in the same country with. And that you know, change in the culture that derived from this powerful cultural force uh, really drove a lot of the cultural changes that made it possible for someone like Donald Trump to, to be elected president. Uh, if I understand what you are saying is uh, after the cable, cable ne networks explosion or development, uh, the television became specialized with different audience. Yes. And this produced a sort of split in the audience. Uh, uh, yeah. This is a problem of Fox News versus CNN or something like that? Um, in part, uh, certainly it's reflected in political media and in television news, but it's not, you know, simply that. Uh, culturally and, you know, in all the experiences that, you know, people are entertained by television or uh, get story from television, 
uh, and make sense of their world through it, different people were having different sorts of experiences. You know, you now have uh, certain television genres or, or programs or outlets that are very popular in rural America and entirely different ones in ur you know, urban America. Um, you have outlets for young people and for old people. You know, so certainly, and all of this ties into political polarization and feeds into it in a lot of ways. But it also, you know, goes beyond that to, to simply the fact that um, all sorts of audiences are siloed and having different experiences where they, where they once had. You know, it didn't used to be the case that television executives in America programmed one kind of TV for people who lived in the country and another kind for people who lived in the city. You know, television was television, and it was for everyone. And that was sort of the definition of mid-20th century television, uh, which was a very sort of culturally homogenizing force. But that turned out to be sort of a very temporary state of affairs, like nothing that came before it and nothing like what came after. Well, and, um I, there was also a change in the way, in the in the way the the narratives were uh, tell in the television, as I understand in your book, and there was a change in the talk shows, different kind of programs, which became very different of the kind of offers that the television had before these networks, these changes in TV in the last 30 year, 40 years. Yeah, I mean, obviously the. Once you have a much greater number of television channels and programming options, it creates a lot of different changes. Um, but one thing it does is that, whereas in the past, you program television in order not to be objectionable to anyone. Now, you're trying to target specific groups and it target things to them that they might be very interested in and yet nobody else is going to watch. Well, what, what that means for sort of the culture and the tone and the metabolism of television is that this is a kind of media that, um, you know, uh, it favors more provocative entertainment, more shocking and sensationalistic entertainment, whether, uh, whether, whether you're talking, and, and, and programming in general, whether you're talking about entertainment television or news. Um, and, and that in turn uh, divides and polarizes the audience more. And it also allows for the rise and popularity of figures like Donald Trump, who both as a politician and as a reality television star, was not the sort of figure who would have been, uh, you know, broadly palatable in the television of, you know, say the 1950s or 1960s. The medium had to change in order to make uh, more sort of polarizing figures tenable in the television environment. It, it was polarizing, but also it pretended to be, for example, the talk shows. Yeah. It pretended to be uh, a kind of show of the reality of the real life. Uh, in the talk show, they invited people, supposedly ordinary people, yeah. with ordinary problems. And uh, this was also a change in the way they, they transformed the everyday drama into a drama of the TV. Uh, don't you think this is also a very important element, how it changed politics? Um, well, you know, it's, it's sort of the a personalization well, of the image of personalized things to reduce to individuals and to persons and this kind of thing. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, I think, you know, the dynamic that you should now expect your specific individual interests to be catered to in the media, um, it, you know, is often reflected in a politics where people are driven to more extreme positions or get more frustrated when they are used to having their individual interests catered to in every other aspect of life and suddenly in politics they're hearing messages that are sort of driven down the middle to appeal to a broad base. So you know that's one that's one thing. And also I think you can see dynamics going on in broader entertainment television as well as news that reflect things that are sort of changes in the zeitgeist of politics. You talked about talk shows and reality shows um, that increasingly tended to rely 
not on trained actors as talent, but bringing ordinary people on the Jerry Springer show to, you know, be outrageous, or building entire reality shows about people living together in a house or on a desert island and having themselves filmed. Uh, and, you know, and, and in a way, but one thing that, that, that in that that messages a kind of change in uh, political messaging is that that starts to it starts to create it starts to impose less of a priority on you know expertise and professionalism and more on rawness and authenticity uh, you know and sort and so a society that sort of you know that accepts and embraces this kind of populist authenticity in entertainment. You know, regular people like me should be on TV is, is the same sort of society that will increasingly respond to political messages, you know, that are more not like, you know, oh, this politician is a very experienced diplomat who has great knowledge of world affairs, but that guy sounds like me. You know, it, 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 it's, you know, it, increasingly you can see these messages and tones in the media the being reflected in politics. The personal character, more than the experience, the knowledge, the expertise of the politicians. Uh, it's yes. more the character, the, the way I feel with close to this guy is better. I don't care if he has no experience in politics or in government. Yes, and um, you know the, the notion that you know a politician like Donald Trump is um, fans of Donald Trump, his political supporters from from the point he started running, would often say about him, he he tells it like it is, right? And what does that mean? It it doesn't mean that they're saying that when he says something, you can believe that it's true, because in fact they often know as well as anyone else that he lies all the he time, sort of time, habitually. Yes. Uh, what they're saying is they're kind of appealing to this notion that also arose in the popular culture of reality TV and so on of authenticity. It's not, you know, he, he tells it like it is doesn't mean he's saying things are true. It's he's saying what he wants to say and he doesn't care what you think about it. He doesn't care if it's hurtful. He doesn't care if it's racist. He doesn't care if you're going to get in trouble for that. And you've created this value system where this authenticity is more important than truth. Very interesting. We are going to make a break. And okay. We come back. Volvemos. Regresamos. Uh, estamos platicando con James Poniewozik. Perdón. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's fine. Uh, uh, it's Polish name and it's not close to my Spanish. Oh yeah, <laughs> it is very difficult. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we, we were talking about these changes in the in the TV, uh, in the way TV has uh, evolu uh, evolved, and now w I want to ask you: there, there is a British writer, Richard Sennett, that talks about um, emptiness of this authenticity. All this. Mm fashion of authenticity or this idea that you have to be authentic to, to go straight. And, and he uh, says that this is not enriched anybody. He has produced emptiness. Uh, he has, uh, the people has lost uh, many elements of his e e everyday relation with others. Mm. Uh, they become more isolated with less means to to understand each other, to talk to each other, to, to have uh, uh, rich relations in, be, uh, among uh, the citizens. What do you think about it? I mean, I, I think that there is a danger of people sort of losing the, uh, the, 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 the talent or the learned ability to cultivate real relationships when more and more of their experience is virtual and through, uh, you know, through media when even their experience of, say, real people is, you know, people who they are friends with on Twitter or on social media. And so you're engaging with a person on social media, but you're actually engaging with the performance of that person uh, that is, you know, that, that they are able to shape through that medium. You know, that said, I don't think that valuing authenticity 
whether in individuals or in politicians, is inherently a bad thing. Uh, you know, I think that there but is. But it's really authentic. Um, well, well, the, the, that's the the issue is that you know, is is what you're valuing actual authenticity, actually being genuine, or is it a kind of performance where just the willingness to be outrageous and to hurt reads as authenticity because you know you're you're rebelling against politeness, um, well, and 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 you know I think that can be a danger. This this story that you tell here in the, in the book about mm -hmm. the changes in television. Don't you think about this kind of uh, narratives that was, was in the past? There was, not, it's not a change also in the way programs were, were shown in the television, but there is also a symbolic culture in the, I think the United States, the I don't know if in television, but the, the cinema, American cinema, built a language of uh, sensuality, of uh, 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 l personal relations. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of m movies about this in the 50s, 60s, maybe even 70s. And now this is changing. All the culture is changing. This is what I think it means, this author means when they say it's producing, this idea of authenticity is producing emptiness. The narratives have changed. There is le less references, symbols. Uh, I don't know. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, that also echoes, I mean, one thing I write about to some extent in, in my book is this notion of, I, I jokingly like to say that like Donald Trump is the world's most successful postmodernist, which is to say that, you know, so much of his public identity has been about recognizing the power of symbol and the fact that the thing that represents the thing is often more persuasive to people than uh, the, the thing itself. Uh, you know, I guess you could say that like, Americans have always been talented. Uh, like one of our great national products is reproductions and facsimiles of things, right? Like we made we made Disney Disneyland, and you know pioneered so many genres of of, of television. And in, in my book, I, I cite um, uh, this this great essay by uh, Umberto Eco, yes. uh, 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 the Italian theorist, yes. in uh, the the 1970s called Travels in Hyper Reality, and he visited a number of um, reproductions and and facsimiles. Uh, built in America, uh, you know, a, a, a carbon copy of President Lyndon Johnson's Oval Office and so forth. And one thing he did was he went to Disneyland, went on the, the river tour where you're going down the boat and they have these robotic animals that act out for you, right? And, and he talked about how when you go to Disneyland, you see a crocodile in the water and it does things that you think a crocodile is supposed to do. It rears up out of the water and it opens its jaws. And if you went into the wild and saw a real crocodile, it'd probably be sleeping, it'd probably be mostly under the water. It's much more boring. And, and the point that he was making with that uh, is that in this culture of reproductions, the, the artificial thing seems more real to people because it comports with their daydream ideas of what a thing is supposed to be like than it is. Getting back to, you know, to the subject of this book, that has been these sort of media environments that are kind of real and kind of fictional. Reality TV, talk shows, professional wrestling in which Donald Trump appeared, uh, these kind of semi-truthful, semi-real environments have been environments in which he's thrived. And I think that is a very powerful, uh, maybe frightening so, frighteningly so, base for a politician to, to operate from. Well, and uh, let me change a little bit. And now with the Twitter, with Facebook, many yeah. people say that they Twitter, Facebook, all these kind of uh, technologies are uh, displacing TV from the public uh, scene and maybe from politics. What do you think about? What's the future of tele? TV? I think in the long term, that's probably true. I don't think it's happened yet in the short term. I mean, certainly Twitter, Facebook, and so on have very powerful effects in politics now. Whether it is bringing together, you know, passionate groups of followers, uh, not just of Donald Trump, but politicians like Bernie Sanders in the United States, 
uh, you know, organizing political movements in other countries uh, and so forth. And, you know, negative effects like the easy spread of disinformation and fakes. And all of that is very powerful. On a national political level, it still tends to be most popular when it is an, an influencer and when it is amplified by television. So when an attack on Twitter becomes news on CNN, you know, when, when, when uh, you know, I, I, I still think that that megaphone of television, uh, you know, on, on the whole, it uh, still carries more weight. 20 years from now, you know, it may not be. We, it, we may be but so fragmented that. Donald Trump tweets, everybody in the world yeah. knows what he tweet uh, today. The news uh, takes this. Uh, Donald Trump tweet this kind of thing. He said this about Mexicans. He said it yeah. about uh, uh, Middle East. He says this about um, uh, and not necessarily the video or the TV programs. It's well, but it, it's but becoming it more universal. The Twitter. It is yes, it is more universal. You know, Twitter makes everybody a broadcaster, right? Somebody like Donald Trump, you know, has a Twitter account, and he is basically he basically has a a media empire with an audience of seventy million people. Um, but it's also very powerful for its effects in legacy media like television. One thing that Donald Trump is doing, if he tweets some outrageous accusation in the morning on Twitter. He's not just going around CNN, he's programming CNN. He's given them their assignment to carry out for the day. And if you watch the news with, you know, the unhealthy regularity that I do, it's very effective. Um, because one of the greatest things you can do for a TV news programmer is kind of do their job for them and provide them a storyline. You know, and if you're holding press conferences the first thing in the morning or ranting on Twitter the first thing in the morning, that's the day's story. That sets the, you know, sets, sets the, the narrative. And how do you, let me ask you another thing. How do you see next elections, this year elections in the United States, about medias and about how to, they are going to behave? And can you foresee something? Uh, um, okay, on Donald Trump's end, you know, I won't go into detail on it, but my book discusses a lot of the ways that Donald Trump took advantages of weaknesses and tendencies in the media that I think the media to some extent has, has learned about. In other words, when he was running for in 2016, he was such a novelty that all the cable channels would run his rallies, you know, over an hour long, beginning to end. Those were just tremendous free advertisements. Um, you know, CNN, only Fox News does that now. Uh, because Fox News is, is on his side. So, you know, I think networks like CNN have learned from that. I think that one of the universal failings of media in 2016 was that nobody believed that Donald Trump could win. Well, now we know that Donald Trump can win an election. So, you know, so, so, so that's different. In that sense, he has some of his same assets, but is operating in a different environment. For the Democrats running against him, there is kind of this large meta argument in the Democratic primary, which is how do we defeat Donald Trump in the field of the media? And every candidate kind of has a little bit of a different theory of the case. Do you sort of try to beat Trump at his own game? Do you find different ways of gaining media attention? Or do you just rely on the, the hope that people are so exhausted by four years of the Donald Trump show that you just tell them, I'll be boring. You vote for me. You won't have to look at your phone every morning, every morning. You know, just be. Uh, you know, and, and and. What do you think of this last alternative? Well, Is you know, that's that's the thing. Like, I don't like to be a, a prognosticator <laughs> about this. As somebody who studies the media, I'm very skeptical of the idea that you can defeat something with nothing. You know, by by you know, not counter programming, but just saying I'll let you turn the TV off. Having said that, it is possible that this is you know, one more thing in the media that Donald Trump has changed so much through the unusualness of his presidency that this wouldn't have worked in the past, but it might now. Um, but yeah, I'm skeptical of that. You, you think that Donald Trump will repeat his sketch and he will become a very strong candidate? Sure. I mean, and, and part, you know, part of that has to do with things that have nothing to do with television. In, incumbents, incumbent presidents tend to win re-election in yes, the United sure. States. Um, but, you know, also, he won the 2016 election by being the protagonist 
of the story. You know, by being so controversial and attention getting and fascinating, horrifying, whatever you want to call it, that people just could not stop paying attention to him and therefore he was the main character. Well, presidents have all sorts of weapons. Besides Twitter, they can use actual policy to make themselves the center of the story. Um, and, and, and so it may be that much harder to, you know, push him out of the center of attention whatever other liabilities he has, well, you know, he, which he does have some disadvantages. His polls are not necessarily that high for a president with a good economy. No time, yes. But he has a tremendous talent and a lot of tools for getting attention. Well, unfortunately, our program is finishing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. It was a great talk. And, well, the people should... La gente debe leer el libro. Espero que llegue pronto aquí a nuestras librerías. Haya una traducción del libro para que podamos leerlo, es en realidad una historia fascinante. Son dos historias que se conectan, o es una historia fascinante de dos caras, en donde por un lado está cómo evoluciona el personaje Donald Trump y cómo por el otro lado evolucionan los medios de comunicación. Apenas tuvimos una oportunidad muy breve de tener este, esta imagen del libro, pero yo espero que pronto quede, te, lo tengan en sus manos y espero que esté en español. Y creo que es muy importante y aleccionador lo que aquí pueden leer. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you.